So first we would like to just welcome and thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, for those of you who are new to our monthly webinars, uh, my name is Erica Lockhart. And my name is Lauren and, and together we are ahead of the curve homes with Compass. Um, today we're actually joined by two special guests. We have Jeff Edwards of Insignia Mortgage and Paul Tenen of Lender and Associates uh, Property Management and Maintenance. And we'll introduce them a little later as they'll be sharing some valuable insight on lending guidelines as it pertains to multifamily properties as well as uh, property management strategies. Um, each month uh, we focus on a different topic and today we'll really kind of dive into the, the 101s and the, the nuts and bolts of multifamily uh, investment properties. Okay. First thing we're gonna go through is um, the market update. So we'll provide you with a general update of the market as it specifically pertains to multifamily uh, income properties. And um, before we get started, A, we love to hear from you. So if you have any questions while we're going through this, all you do is move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see a little icon pop up that says chat. So just type in whatever questions come up for you and we'll definitely address that. Also, Erica and I want to say we'd love to hear from you in terms of um, feedback on what we're doing, but also suggestions. So if there are topics that you really want to hear about, um, we want to accommodate that and we're all ears. So please share your ideas with us as well as um, questions you might have going through. So we'll start now with the um, market update. I'm going to share the screen. So just give me a minute. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, we're going to start with the key uh, neighborhoods and markets that we serve, which include Baldwin Hills, Baldwin Vista, Ladera Heights, View Park, and Windsor Hills. Um, overall, we're seeing that volume for new listings, pending sales, and closed sales is pretty much down across the board year over year, with new listings dropping by 43% and sold sales by 72%. Um, and just so you know, we're seeing the exact same thing in the, the residential real estate marketplace as well. Volume is down year over year. And although volume is down, what we are seeing is that the average sales price is either holding steady or it's increasing. And in this case, it's increased um, year over year by 24%. Um, and I should point out this data reflects first quarter and second quarter 2019 in comparison to first quarter or second quarter 2020. I do feel like the price went up in these areas. So moving though. on to the next market. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I okay. can hear you. Um, okay. So here we have Mar Vista Q1 and 2 2019 compared to Q1 and 2 2020. Uh, the volume of listings actually went up. Um, the pending and sold sales went down a little bit, but not too much. Uh, the average days on market went down and the prices went down just by 4% comparing those quarters. Um, so, I mean, Mar Vista still remains a really, really strong market and the price going up, I want to say in the Baldwin Hills area by 24%. I mean, that area is just seeing so much growth in every way you know, infrastructure, all kinds of things going in there. So it's amazing um, that even in 2020 and Q1 and two of 2020, that it's outperforming, you know, 2019. And that has everything to do with the area, I would say. But Mar Vista holding really strong. Okay, so moving on to Culver City. So similar to what we're seeing in all areas, uh, volume is down across the board. Uh, with new listings dropping by 15% and total cl closed sales by 84%. Um, the average days on market um, that you see in 2020 um, is actually a little skewed because it's only reflecting data for one closed sale. So there was only one closed multifamily sale um, first quarter, second quarter of this year. Um, here we are also seeing average sales price uh, decrease by 33%. Again, um, the data is somewhat you know, unreliable and skewed in that it's only reflecting just that one, one closed sale. And now we have Santa Monica. So again, um, 
sold listings when new listings went down by uh, about 50%, which is to be expected given COVID-19. Uh, the pending listings had no change whatsoever. The solds were down by 31%. Um, and the prices went down. The days on market actually went up um, in 2020, which is also understandable because uh, things that had been on the market right before COVID hit, you know, they had to sit through a period of just basically nothing happening until people were out again. And um, prices are down by 17%. So once things started kind of coming back, people are looking for deals, especially in the multifamily market, because there's a lot of uh, sort of, you know, you're depending on renters to pay your mortgage and, you know, scrutinizing renters has become even more important than it ever was. So it's to be expected that these prices went down a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Okay. Um, okay, Rodney, do you wanna get into the first few questions for us? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. So I have a few questions for Lauren and Erica. And Lauren, actually, this question is for you. And it's one of our primary questions. And it's, what is a multifamily property investment? Okay. Well, first, I want to say this is Rodney Williams. And he's our go-to guy for everything extraordinaire. So I just want to introduce you properly, Rodney. And um, what is a multifamily property? I mean, a multifamily investment property is just what it sounds like. It's a building of usually up to four units. So anywhere between two to four units that people are buying as an investment, not as their primary residence, okay? The lending does change. So up to four units, you can get a residential loan. Above four units, um, lending guidelines change and it becomes a commercial loan. So typically we're defining these properties as up to four units. Um, you can have an investment property that's a single family house as well um, that you don't live in, that you just have as an investment. That's not the kind of property we're focusing on right now. Awesome. And our next question is for Erica. What should you look for when investing in a multifamily property or properties? So this is going to be somewhat of a long response, um, but because, you know, investing in multifamily properties requires a lot more attention than other real estate deals, an investor's first concern should always be on the numbers. Um, you know, these financial figures will not only expose the true value of the investment, but it will also reveal the overall bottom line. And I won't get into the nitty, but you'll want to get familiar with terms such as capitalization rates or, or cap rates. Um, gross rent multiplier, which is only referred to as GRM, and net operating income. Um, all of these metrics will help you in analyzing your potential return on the investment. And what I'll do when I'm done answering, I will go into the chat section and add those three terms and the definitions for those, just so you can get familiar with, with what they actually mean. Um, in addition to the numbers, I think there's a selection of underlying factors that can um, and will influence multifamily investing. Um, the first factor is location. We say this all the time in real estate, like location, location, location. And it actually applies to any business. It's all about being in the best location. Um, and even more so when investing in multifamily properties. So with more tenants, you know, each and every unit will need to appeal to renters. Um, and location is typically the, the most desired criteria. When investing in multifamily properties, you know, investors should pay attention to high growth, um, high yield areas, you know, up and coming areas, um, areas that have, you know, well maintained neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are central to public transportation. Um, I can't stress that enough. We're seeing a ton of opportunity for investors, um, you know, all along the expo line. People want to live close to the train. They're, they're tired of commuting back and forth to work. So if you can find a property or a great opportunity near an expo line or any sort of public transportation, um, I highly, highly recommend it. Another factor is total number of units, um, which means you need to evaluate the property, you know, as a whole. Investors should take into, into consideration, obviously, the number of units on the property, including like the rooms in each unit. As a beginning investor, um, 
you should really fo focus on like residential income. So like duplex, triplex, and fourplex. Um, these types of properties not only offer, I think, the most upside, um, with the least amount of risk for beginning investors, but they're generally just more affordable than like a traditional commercial multifamily. Um, and I think the last step is, and probably one of the more important ones, is determining the, the income a property can generate. So um, in many cases, as you're looking at listings, the listing will actually itemize the actual scheduled income um, as well as provide projected income. Um, so you wanna make sure that the rental income that's being received um, can support the mortgage and any sort of additional operating expenses um, that you may have. So, so to recap, I would say the numbers, location, unit mix, and the potential income of the property. Those are four key criteria. And I do have one thing to add that's really important. Projected income is like uh, wonky. <laughs> it can be a, a very aspirational number, and that is where your realtors come in to give you like accurate comps about what we project, what, what is the highest that you can get in this marketplace and to provide you with actual data. Because when people are trying to sell a property, you know, they can really fill that number in with anything that they like, frankly. Nice. So that leads me into asking Erica, can you com com compare the benefits of investing in a single family property or a multifamily property versus yeah. a multifamily property? So I think, you know, for those considering, you know, taking the plunge and investing in multifamily properties or single family properties, um, meaning like buying a house and choosing to rent it out as opposed to purchasing like a duplex, triplex or fourplex. Um, I think it's important to understand which investment vehicles do what. Um, and truth be told, deciding among single family versus multifamily is largely about your personal preference and your overall you know, investment goals. Uh, multifamily or residential income typically yields a bigger cash flow um, than like a single family property investment. And it provides you with an added bonus. You have the potential to um, subsidize your living expenses by, you know, living in one of the units and leasing out the others. And you don't have that, that privilege if you're just, you know, purchasing a single family home for investment. Um, I think another underlying benefit of investing in multifamily properties is less risk. Uh, the reason there's less risk is because there's a larger pool of tenants. So unlike single family homes, like when the property is vacant, you're not generating any sort of income. But with a multifamily um, investment, you know, if there are vacancies, at least you're receiving additional income from the other tenants. So it's kind of helping alleviate that, that economic loss. Um, in comparison, I think one of the obvious advantages of investing in a single family property is probably cost. Um, you know, the price for these um, is generally much lower than multifamily properties, but not always. Um, and there's also additional expenses sometimes with, with an, a single family home um, in terms of um, the maintenance. Um, in addition, most rental agreements will require the tenant to pay for the majority of the utilities as well as take responsibility sometimes for like landscaping and things like that. So the, the long-term maintenance costs are definitely much cheaper. And it's also important to note that for, for one reason or another, um, single family investments, they tend to appreciate more than like a multifamily property. Um, it could be a variety of factors, um, but it mostly pertains to how lenders value each type of investment. Um, unlike multifamily properties, you know, which sometimes are valued on the rents, uh, depending on the size of the property and the condition of the property. Um, single family homes are valued on, you know, supply and demand. So if it's well maintained and situated in a great neighborhood, you know, buyers will always be in demand for, for single family properties. Um, and then single family properties are also easier to manage. It's much easier to manage, you know, one tenant as opposed to, you know, two to four tenants. Um, so investors can choose from, you know, becoming the landlord and managing the property themselves and hiring or, you know, hiring a professional management company to, to oversee the investment. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. So I wanted to see if we had, I know that our, one of our audience members, Gavin, he had a question regarding this section. Um, Gavin, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to ask your question and then we'll transition into the next section. Maybe he can put his put his question in the chat and we can we can answer it at the end, Rodney, if he's having Hello. connection 
Yes. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. I, I had to unmute myself. I'm sorry. Okay. So. That's okay. Hello, everybody. Erica, Rodney. Hi. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess two quick questions. Uh, first one, is it possible to still get involved in multifamily purchasing with no money down? Are there still programs or is that possible? And what kind of FICO score would I need personally? Or is that not a key factor as per se in regards to single family uh, in units or properties? I think we'll turn this question over to, to Jeff um, of Insignia Mortgage. He can answer that question since it's finance related. Okay. Hi there, how are you? Hey, how you doing, Jeff? Good, good. So currently there's no, um, no money down programs, but there are FHA programs that allow for as little as 3% down. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were to um, purchase this as a primary residence, say it's a two unit or three unit, and your, your intentions are to occupy one of the units, you can get owner occupied pricing. Mm -hmm. So um, I, would, I would run that. I have a few scenarios that I ran uh, just for like a traditional 25% down on a million dollar purchase and uh, multifamily, four units, uh, maybe one unit you occupy, two or three are rented. Um, unbelievably, mm -hmm. the rates are down at 2.875 for the wow. family right now, which is really incredible. There's, you know, there's about a, a half point fee to get that rate, but they're very well priced. Um, what I could do is if you wanted to, I, will our information be shared with them where I can? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So what I could do is I could have you maybe uh, ping me with your email or something or leave a note and I'll, I'll, I'll jot it down and I'll give you an idea of how little can you, uh, uh, how little down can you on a proposed purchase. Okay, great, yeah. perfect, thank you. Sure. Great, thank you. Mm, thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask Jeff the questions that I had prepared. Um, okay, so Jeff, you just explained one scenario. Um, wow. I, I don't I don't know if there is like a set answer to this. What are the down payment requirements for a property of up to four units, or you know, is it all over the place? Well, it's it is it is a bit all over the place depending on the purchase price. But if if we were to say a um, you know maybe a two through four unit with a loan amount uh, under a million, uh, you can get a Fannie Freddie or FHA loan uh, with as little as three percent down. So, um, you know, there's mortgage insurance that would come along with that. And there's higher upfront fees that you actually can build into the loan. So they're very, and, and it's allowed to have up to, you know, 5% credit from the seller. So there's very, for the FHA type products, they're very well priced because they are government insured. And uh, so you'd see an incredibly low uh, rate on those. They do have a higher uh, fee, but if you were to take, uh, let's just say a 25% down, um, depending on the loan being, you know, uh, depending on the loan amount, Fannie and Freddie goes up to 1.4 million for four units in LA County. So you can see that there's a very broad mix of um, properties that, that could fall into that um, with that high of a Fannie Freddie loan limit. So you're unlikely to get 3% down on some of those bigger transactions. But um, like I said, I can run for us uh, when I get off and send this off to you, you know, maybe as little as 10% uh, down on some of these bigger purchases. And on the Fannie Freddie loans that you're just describing, what is like approximately the rates on those, the range? Well, because it depends if you're, if you're buying it strictly as a, as a non-owner occupied, mm -hmm. um, then it's going to be different rates than what I, that I'm, than what I'm quoting here, maybe by 50%. So let's just say that, for an owner occupied, you're going to occupy one of the four units. Uh, you could expect to see low rates in the high twos to maybe low threes, three and a quarter percent. Uh, adding a full non-owner occupied, uh, where all, all units will be occupied uh, as an investment property, you'll probably see up to three quarters of a percent higher rate on those. Okay. Still low. Yeah, very low. <laughs> Okay, so what? So then the next question is income requirements. So you kind of, what are the income requirements that we're talking about? Well, so what's nice about the, 
so are we are we for the most part talking about primary residences is that someone's going to occupy one of the units is that the idea of this or are we talking both because um well, we're talking about both like maybe they're one of the units would be occupied but also purchasing it as a strict and strictly as an investment you live somewhere else yeah so if you don't mind let me uh it'll only take me a few seconds here okay um because i have this queued up as a non-owner occupied investment property let's see here so it would be you know in the it would be in the high three percent for a full non-owner occupied Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And and um and income and so income requirements. Let's say it's up to that one point four million price range. Well, what are the, how are the lenders looking at the? Yeah, the, so it's going to be the income yeah. of the building or the income of the borrower. Both, both. So you're going to take the income of the building. So if you're buying a four unit and you're going to occupy one, mm -hmm. in, in the case of a primary residence, you're going to be able to take the three. You're going to be able to take the three rentals that are in there and take 75% rent roll. So if the three units bring in 10,000, you'll be able to take 7,500 of that income and apply it towards your debt ratios for qualifying. Mm -hmm. So then you just have to come up with the other, you would have to come up with the difference. So with a high yielding building, uh, you can actually get in with fairly low income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good to know. And the FHA products allow for uh, any non-owner occupied. So you can have a parent or a brother or an uncle or a grandparent that can, uh, you know, that can co-sign on those. Okay. Um, great. So I think you just answered this. Does the property need to generate a certain gross income to qualify for financing? It doesn't if your income is strong enough to carry the debt service. Okay. So it sounds like every situation is really uh, individualized. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, is the loan approval process different from the uh, process of just buying a straight single family owner occupied home? The difference is, is that when you appraise the property, the appraiser is going to do a rental survey uh, to determine what, what the rents are in the area. And um, basically that's it. There's, there's really not a whole, it's, it's going to be financed just the same. You're going to take the income of the building. They're going to take your income, group it together, and how, how is the debt ratios? And you can get close to 50% debt ratio. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like those appraisals would be more expensive, though, or take more time. But yeah, slightly more. You, you pay for the rental survey. So, you know, maybe maybe an extra two or three, maybe an extra $200 on an appraiser appraisal. Not a lot. Okay. And what type of documentation is required for multifamily properties? Well, it's really up to four units. It's going to be exactly the same as a single family. So if you are a wage earner and you receive a W-2 and a pay sub, that would be it. If you're self-employed, it would be it. your personal returns, your business returns, and uh, you know, a year-to-date P&L, and um, basically that's it. Of course, your assets and driver's license, but from an income perspective, uh, they are they are full doc uh, transactions. Now, there are there are bank statement programs which are the, which are considered a non QM loan, and those loans are let's say that you're self employed and you have a business that does well, but at the end of the end of the day, your personal tax returns um, don't look as good. Um, there are bank statement programs where you can actually use the cash flow of your business. Let's say that you had a business where you sold, it could be, you could sell phone cases and you sell $400,000 a year in phone cases. Uh, that $400,000 would be discounted by 50% and the lenders would give you 50% of that bank statement income and you can qualify off of that. Now, those aren't loans that you'd be able to place at Fannie and Freddie, but those loans are in the alternative space called non-QM lending. And there's uh, kind of pre-COVID, those were plentiful. And then with COVID, they completely evaporated and they're starting to come back into the market. So those loans uh, have, I would say, pre-COVID were really well priced. And those really fit a huge need for those who uh, are self-employed. Right. So have bigger bigger cash deposits in their in their business account than they do on their personal tax return. Got it. Okay. Um, and then our interest rates for multifamily and then interest rates for single family 
Uh, just slightly, just slightly different. Yeah, just maybe an eighth to a quarter in rate. Very, very little difference if it's owner occupied. Okay, and non-owner occupied, you said it's going to be about three quarters of a percent higher. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions for Jeff? Rodney, are there any? Yes. So we have two questions in the chat at the moment. Okay. The first question is, does FICO play a role? It does. Yes. So okay. the less down you put, the more sensitive the lender is. If you were putting a larger down payment, let's just say that you were going to put down up to 25% and even a different case would be 40% down because maybe you're selling another property and you're bringing that equity into this property, into your new property, um, they're less sensitive. So when you're below 60%, there's very little change in rate or fee due to FICO score. Uh, a, a decent FICO score, let's say something that's in the mid sixes is still required. But as you start getting into 10% down or you know, even a 20% down, 25% down, those are very sensitive to FICO scores. There can be large adjustments due to FICO score. So okay. FICO scores are something that can be worked on typically if you have, um, you know, they can be reviewed and, and usually within a few minutes, uh, you can get a good idea on how to, maybe a game plan on how to improve your FICO score over time. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And our last question before we transition into introducing Paul, is are there different criteria to consider if we are looking for properties to flip? And this may be a question for... Yeah. I think that would be for Lauren and Erica. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I think that the criteria, if you're looking for a property to flip, is, is going to still uh, revolve around the location, the neighborhood, what's going on in the neighborhood, I mean, I'll go back to the stats that we presented, like the Baldwin Hills area, you know, went up by 24%. I mean, you know, because the Crenshaw line is going in, because the Expo line is there. And it's a really hot neighborhood that people want to get into versus Santa Monica, which is the most high end neighborhood has gone down. So um, I think that what you want to look for if you're looking for properties to flip is, is really the neighborhood. And then of course you wanna look at the property itself and you know, is there opportunity to add value you know, to that property? What is the architecture? You know, architecture plays a role. Anything that has like charm, that is maybe like a Spanish style or a Tudor that can be brought back to, to some form of glory you know, has tremendous upside because um, architecture you know, holds its value. And I, the only thing I would add is, and then the numbers too, like the numbers play a huge part. You want to make sure that whatever the acquisition cost is, that whatever you need to invest in terms of the renovation budget and whatever holding costs you may have, that, you know, at the end of the day, there's profit to be made um, as opposed to losing money or, you know, potentially even breaking even. So you really kind of need to do a cost benefit analysis and really analyze, you know, the cost versus what you need to invest versus what you could potentially sell it for. Awesome. So that actually concludes our questions for this section in the chat room. Thank you. So now we are going to focus a little bit on um, tenant landlord related questions, property management related questions. Um, and joining us is Paul Tenen. Um, Paul is the president of Lender and Associates. Uh, Linder and Associates is a real estate management and maintenance firm based here in Los Angeles. Um, I have to say this, Paul graduated from the University of Southern California. I'm a fellow Trojan, so fight on. <laughs> um, oh, there's more Trojans. Um, and um, Paul, his portfolio has continued to expand annually and now includes more than 2,200 apartments, uh, apartment units in 150 buildings of varying, varying size and 900,000 square feet of rentable space at retail complexes in prime Southland communities. So um, he is very seasoned and well-versed in managing properties, that's for sure. Thank so you. the first question um, that I have for you, Paul, is you know, what is the role of a property manager? Sure, well, thank you very much for having me today, and I really appreciate being here. Um, 
you know, my opinion of, the, of what a property manager is, is considered a fiduciary, somebody who acts in the best interests of the client to represent them, in this case, in what is, in many cases, uh, their most important financial asset. So we take it very seriously. Um, our job is to operate, maintain, and protect the value of the interest and the asset. And um, so we are a little bit of everything. We're property managers. We're also uh, psychologists. Uh, we are uh, lawyers sometimes, uh, you know, and just try to be as much as, of a help as we can be to all of the clients that we serve. And what are typical property management fees that a, you know, investment property owner could expect to pay? So typically uh, for, uh, let's say, you know, one to four unit type properties, um, you know, it would start with a minimum fee, uh, you know, something that is um, subject to the budget really with, you know, let's say a few tenants in the building. Um, our fees generally range from 5% of the, the gross income collected um, and that works its way through mostly larger buildings, uh, I should say maybe 10 units and more um, or 15 units and more. So um, a bulk of our properties are anywhere from even 30 to 50 unit buildings um, and then larger you know, strip centers and things like that. But when it comes to some of the smaller uh, unit properties, um, you could find yourself anywhere between maybe three to 5% or uh, a, a flat fee. We've worked out flat fees with clients just because there's just not a lot of room in the budget for us to do that. But another uh, avenue that we've explored to help clients where they say, you know, we want to we want to collect our own rent, we want to still be involved in the management is we've parceled out our services. So uh, we offer leasing services, we offer maintenance services. So um, I have a staff of maintenance uh, technicians um, that are full time with us that do servicing and then we, we work with a lot of vendors that um, work for us full time pretty much. So they give us great prices and uh, we have several clients that we actually don't manage for, but we do leasing and maintenance services for. And that has helped a lot of clients who, you know, don't have the budget for us to do a lot of the, you know, the paperworking and the notices and that and the collection of rent and facilitation, but yet they still need help in a few different areas. So that's been helpful as well. Got it. Okay. Um, and then speaking of paperwork, what's the best way to manage rent increases? Uh, let's see. So uh, unfortunately with, you know, what's going on with the moratorium right now, um, you know, those rent increases are on hold for at least a year. Um, you know, so there's not a lot of activity happening in that respect. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, they come on the anniversary of the lease term. Um, so at the uh, turn of that lease, after their initial lease term, there's uh, generally speaking a 4% increase um, in rents. Uh, uh, for commercial stores and leases, there's probably a scheduled income raise. Um, but uh, also keeping in mind that there are additional bumps for utilities paid. So if a landlord pays all utilities, for each utility that they pay, they can actually add a one uh, percentage point increase. So if, this, if the standard is 4% in LA City, um, you can increase additional uh, percentage point for every, for gas utility, if you pay the gas bill, if you pay electric bill, some of the buildings we manage are master metered buildings. So the tenants don't pay any utilities. We you know, the owner would pay for all of them. And so uh, there's some scale up for that as well. Okay. Um, in your opinion, what's the biggest challenge facing today's landlord or income property owner? Sure. So, you know, um, it's been a challenging landscape the last few months, several months now. Uh, feels like forever ago when it was March. Um, and things were just getting underway with COVID, um, you know, and so there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of unknown. It's very hard to plan when you, when, you know, the, even the moratorium keeps moving back and for back and, you know, more and more, it, it's very difficult to plan, project, negotiate, 
um, you know, set up relationships. So that's been a challenge uh, for the clients, not knowing, you know, what their income is going to be. Uh, a lot of tenants have, you know, really struggled and a lot of landlords have struggled very much so as well. I mean, one of the things that I'm a big advocate for is letting people know that uh, the clients that we manage and are responsible for have been very uh, flexible with the tenants and their need to pay what they can to set up payment relationships to forgive rent, which I don't think is something that's broadcasted very much, but um, there's a lot of people hurting uh, in, on both sides. And so, you know, our goal as, a, as an agent of these clients is to serve as a conduit uh, between the, to, to be the relationship builder between the tenants and and the owners and to be able to communicate as I mentioned earlier one of the biggest um, uh, advantages that we've had is that we've built better relationships with tenants so um, one of the keys to a collection of rent and the numbers that we've been able to get has been based on the fact that our resident managers um, who've had relationships with tenants in their buildings that have been there for a long time have had a better success in collection than the ones that haven't made any efforts or haven't returned calls of tenants or haven't been open to being flexible with tenants. So I would say that um, that's now become one of our primary goals is to continue to build relationships and keep the conversations going. Uh, we're very adaptive. We've ch we're changing every day. Um, and so all of those have been things that we've worked on to, you know, help make it easier. But unfortunately, it's been a bit of a rocky road, to say the least. So I think you kind of answered this next question uh, regarding COVID-19 and the eviction moratorium and the impact it's had on your clients. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, certainly in our commercial portfolio, it's it's been worse than in the residential portfolio. Um, you know, it's very hard to convince people to pay rent when they've been closed for months. There's no business to be had. You know, there was times when they were open and then had to close down again. So there's that rubber band effect. Um, so the challenge for us has been having to keep the conversation going to keep the fire active with people with just not letting them, you know, um, go into the dark, you know, but hey, let's work out a plan. Let's, how are we going to navigate this? What, what is it that you're going to do? And we've told, we've even gotten to help some of the tenants by telling them ways that they can adapt their business. So we have some businesses that are in stores that are restaurants. So we said, you know, you got to get online with Uber and these other services to start sending food out another way, rather than just close your doors and sort of give up. Um, and a lot of tenants have actually been appreciative of those suggestions because they did give up and they really didn't know what they were going to do because they were a restaurant where people were eating in their, predominantly eating in their space. You know, the folks that have survived this have been the ones that could take their product and be able to get it out to people either whether they're dining on the street or, you know, at home. Uh, but we have, we have tenants that are Korean barbecue restaurants that you go to specifically to make your food at their establishment and those have suffered dramatically and so um, you know uh, but again what we've seen are a lot of things adapting so we've seen tenants take what their product was and completely change it you've seen that with face masks coming out of a lot of uh, apparel companies and things so what you're seeing are uh, adaptations of businesses forming, which has been a bright spot to say the least. And um, thank you for that. Uh, what's the best advice you can provide to, you know, a future landlord or a future, you know, someone that's considering uh, purchasing residential income property? Sure. Um, you know, uh, I would say that I, I, I strongly encourage investment in the multifamily property. I think that if you have uh, as I've heard on a few folks on the call today is, you know, definitely getting into a diversified asset, you know, with two to four or more tenants is definitely a good idea because you diversify your risk. That's, that's definitely true. Um, I think that 
what we've learned in this experience has been to become more familiar and um, uh, forward with your tenants. So if you're going to be buying, if you're new to the market and you're buying a duplex, I would be very hands-on. I wouldn't offer it so much to a property manager just to take it away in a sense, not until it's stabilized and not until the tenants that you've put in there and all the blood, sweat and tears that you put into the building has happened so that you get it to a place where you feel comfortable. Because what ends up happening is a lot of owners buy a property and they'll give it away to someone to run it and they don't put their personal touch. And what we have found through this experience is that personal touch has really saved us in, set, in a sense that tenants feel inclined to respect the property and respect the ownership and, and the process if they feel a personal commitment to the place and a personal ownership. So I have felt like that's been a key to our success and I definitely recommend that for any new buyer. Um, definitely buy what you can afford and definitely not go overboard to the, to the point where you won't have any funds to put money in because no matter what you do, you're gonna have to put some capital into the property um, on day one just to clean it up, just to freshen it up. Maybe there's a vacancy you gotta turn quickly so I wouldn't over leverage. Um, but certainly now is the time more than ever with the interest rates being what they are um, to take advantage of the market and, um, and also take a chance. And I think that's really important. I think uh, all the clients that we work for took a risk in, in, in buying their assets and they've been able to, I saw some questions about 1031 exchanges and flipping. Um, you know, it's, a, it's always gonna be a scary time. It's never been an easy time, but people that, that take those risks have been rewarded, so. Thank you. Um, Lauren, I think you had a question for Paul. I do have one question, but I just want to hit really quickly on the 1031 exchange. Um, just so people understand what that is, if it's a non a non owner occupied property can be sold and you can defer the taxes entirely. If you buy another property that's not if this is for non owner occupied. So if you own, let's say a, a triplex and you sell it and you make a profit. You won't have, you can defer all of your tax payments on that if you put the money into another income property. And that's what is a 1031 exchange. And that's one of the huge advantages of getting started with residential income property is that over time you can buy your way up and you can defer the taxes along the way. I don't think we got into that, but it's important. That's one of the major advantages. Okay, so my last question for Paul is about service animals because that has become a big thing in California. And um, how, when a person ap applies for a lease, they do not have to indicate that they have a service animal. So how are you dealing, you know, with that? I mean, are there, if people have animals that are inappropriate for the space or just like really odd, um, how are landlords and how are you as a manager dealing with that? Sure. Um, you know, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, um, in a lot of ways, we've sort of been rendered helpless because uh, e uh, emotional support animals are now considered in a variety of different categories. So. Uh, as we joked earlier about having a hippopotamus in your apartment, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it's hard for us to dictate to tenants whether they can have the animal or not. Um, we come from a perspective of we don't want that animal to hurt another tenant or even their owner. And that is really the focal point. I mean, Another avenue that we try to avoid is a lot of folks get dogs and they leave the dog in their, or cat in their, I should say dogs, they leave the dog in their apartment all day long while they go to work and the poor dog is, is barking all day long and it's just not right. So for, our, for us, that's a perspective that we come from when, we're do, when we say, you know, we don't want animals in our, you know, our apartments. Obviously, service animals are a different category. So if you are uh, blind and in need of a service animal, that's a different story. But um, emotional support animals are coming in a variety of different ways. Unfortunately, you don't need to add it into your application. A lot of folks um, 
take units and a week later bring in animals that were not on the lease, um, which really is a violation, but uh, with the discriminatory practices that are out there right now, it makes it very hard to avoid or to try to get them to take, you know, take the animal out without going through a number of steps. Um, you know, I could say one of the channels that we've used is uh, to offer an accommodation. So for example, we had a situation where there was a dog bite um, and we had to, through attorneys of course, um, basically require that the owner use a muzzle when they're in the common areas with the dog. And so that was an accommodation that was made for an owner who's had the dog a long time and was not really looking to part with the dog. But at the same time, we did our best to protect the other tenants in the building. Um, so unfortunately, that's, uh, it's been a tough road there. And it is illegal to specifically ask a prospective tenant if they have a service animal? I, I, the application itself says, do you have pets? Um, so asking whether they have them is not, in my opinion, it is not wrong to ask, just like it's not wrong to say how many folks are gonna be living here or you know, along with these other credit credentials that need to apply. Um, what my understanding is, is that you cannot say no simply because they have a service animal um, or that once they move in, they decide to get a service animal. So, uh, you know, so that's yeah, to answer your question there. Okay. Okay. Is there any other questions in the chat, Rodney? Yes. So we have two questions in the chat and the first one is for you, Paul. And the, I mean, I'm sorry, the first one is for you. Yes, Paul. And then the second one could be for the panel. So, Paul, does Lender and Associates vet potential tenants as part of the leasing services? Yeah, so just like we would with the building that we manage, we would get the, um, you know, income uh, verification. We do a, uh, a background check. Um, and uh, we would sometimes use a lease that we have and we apply it to whatever terms are per the client's need, but uh, we do a full background check on it, on the applicants and, um, and we do vet them. Okay. And our second question is, can Paul or someone else speak about rent control and how that plays a role or doesn't in buying decisions, particularly since Inglewood has rent control now? Paul? I could take you, I, yeah, so, um, rent control certainly affects the sale of the property. Um, it, in my experience as a broker many years ago, it was um, that with non-rent controlled properties, the seller basically took your profit. Uh, they sold at a price where they, they sold the property at basically market rate. And so anyone buying a non-rent controlled property uh, was basically buying it for the income that it was generating at the time. Uh, rent control properties allowed for basically the sky's the limit to happen. So if you had an opportunity where tenants were relocated or they simply moved on and you had a vacancy and you were rent, they were paying $700 and you're in a market where now it's maybe double that, that became the motivation to buy a rent control property was for that. And so Prices were definitely and are today, but um, prices are affected. So naturally, a, a a property that where you know the rents are at market, you assume they're at market when it's not rent control because you assume that the owner has raised rents to market. Um, but that's actually not always the case. Um, but at rent control properties typically were under market in rents, and so uh, that would affect the price and the purchase price. Um, nowadays, when most of the city is under a form of rent control, um, prices have definitely leveled out. I can tell you that the people I feel most for are the ones that closed escrow right before they implemented a rent control in the areas that were non before, because those are the ones that really took the biggest hurt because they bought it thinking they could raise rents forever and now they're limited. And so that's, that's been an unfortunate part for some clients who bought in those areas especially in Inglewood. Um, but going forward, now that the, it, there is an established rent control, um, I think what 
again, it comes to what is your potential upside? You know, what can be done? You know, when you're going to buy a property in these areas, you really have to understand um, the rental rates that are currently there so you can understand how much room there is to raise those rates should people decide to leave. And so that would dictate to me what you'd want to buy a building for. When we see rent control properties in the city of LA and everybody's paying $700 and you know the market rate is $1,600, you're far more motivated to buy that property because you take the gamble that one day you'll be able to get those rents up to that rate and um, and that's where you know profit can be made. So, thank you, Paul. So that concludes our questions in the chat. Okay. So if anyone has any additional questions or you think of something later, you can always email us, and we'll be happy to get you the information. In and um, we'll send out um, an email uh, that you'll get with the recording of this call. And um, you'll have our information so that you can easily reach out to us. And I just want to say thank you to Paul and Jeff. You, you have so much information. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. And thank you to everyone who joined. And thank you extra to everyone who asked questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll, we'll be sure to include Paul and Jeff's information in that uh, follow-up email as well in case you have any follow-up questions for them. Okay, so well, thank you everyone for joining. Have a great evening. Stay safe and healthy.